Welcome everybody to our channel. This is uh, the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Here we discuss uh, past paper questions of course as well as topics, uh, various questions on topics as well as information on various topics in biology, chemistry and uh, of course math. So today we're discussing the June 2020 Pearson at Excel International A Level Chemistry paper for Unit 6. Uh, so let's go through it. Uh, this paper is 50 marks. I will begin immediately with question one. Question one says, a uh, compound A is a green solid containing, of course, this is a green solid containing uh, one cation and one anion, of course. So if it's green, we have to be very careful. Sometimes it could be a mixture of two colors or it could just be one color that is green. So for green, you could say, ah, oh, is it uh, chromium three, nickel two, nickel, or is it gonna be iron? If you're not sure, you have to think it could be this if you're thinking about a grain being due to a result of a cation. But there is a possibility of two colors, so be very careful about it. So a sample of compound A was dissolved in distilled water, forming a green solution. Aqueous sodium hydroxide was added to the solution of A until there was no further change. If there was no further change, it means this is in excess, excess addition. Uh, excess sodium hydroxide so it means deprotonation occurred fully then they say a pale blue precipitate b and the yellow solution forms so this tells us because we have a blue and the yellow that result from it it means these two were the green initially so that rules out this iron chromium as well as nickel they're ruled out so we go back to the idea that this could be copper as well as something However, remember again, in the beginning of the question, they said one cation and one anion. If we are establishing that the copper is the one that is blue or copper is the one that is blue, it means the yellow could be the anion. And we know there is only one anion, which is, uh, of course, chromate six. That is the only yellow anion in your syllabus. So let's see the first part it says, a pale blue precipitate B was separated and tested. B dissolved in excess ammonia. Again, this is gonna be, uh, step by drop by top and then excess so this is ligand substitution ligand substitution ligand substitution to form a deep blue solution a deep blue solution of course this is going to be something that was blue that dissolves in excess ammonia to form a deep blue solution is only copper two this is your confirmation there is nothing else so you can know there was a ligand substitution reaction here then they say identify by name of formula b and d we have established that precipitate B is going to be copper 2 hydroxide, or some of you could write it like this, uh, H2O, O, O, H, 2. How can copper 2 hydroxide be formed? Let me get a green color. If you had a hexa aqua, uh, give me a minute, H2O, 6, 2 plus, and you reacted it with sodium hydroxide, of course, we're going to use two of them. We will produce copper again now we have four water ligands and then we have the hydrox the hydroxides are going to be two as well this is going to be the precipitate you form which will further react to form the tetraamine diaqua copper two ions as complex d so complex d is going to be this how do you convert that to that is because here we take away two water ligands and here we take away uh, of course, they're going to be two and here minus two uh, hydroxides. And then we replace them with four ammonias in a reaction between the precipitate with uh, excess ammonia. So our ligand substitution occur. This is the complex we get. Next part says, when another portion of B was heated gently, the solid turned black. Again, you remember we said B was a copper to something, something in copper two. If you heat copper two in uh, in oxygen, or if you heat it gently, it means it's being oxidized. You're allowing it to react with oxygen. And a reaction with oxygen oxidizes the copper to make it into copper two oxide, which is a black solid. So this brings us to uh, the name of the black solid there. Then next they say excess concentrated hydrochloric acid was added. Here it's excess concentrated hydrochloric acid was added to a further portion of B and it was warmed. Remember this one here is a ligand substitution reaction. Every time they give a question about copper, they usually talk about its reaction with a concentrated hydrochloric acid so that they can tell you there was a yellow something formed and that's to show you that there was a tetrachlorocuprate. So copper 
cl four and then two minus which is going to be of course uh the the complex that is going to be formed so they say identify by name or formula the complex and responsible for the yellow color in e the yellow color in e is going to be due to the tetrachlorocuprate tetrachlorocuprate chemistry is really really common when they ask about copper usually copper let's say in a hexa aqua copper two reacts with a concentrated hydrochloric acid to produce copper cl4 of course two minus plus six waters in this case we have seen it many times this is going to be blue this is going to be yellow and the mixture of these two can bring about the green color so of course when you react uh, hexa aqua copper 2 the blue color is going to change to green and the green is going to change to yellow as the two colors blue and uh, blue and yellow come together you'll see a green color before the final thing turns to yellow so let us go to the next part here we see a yellow solution c was tested five centimeters cubed of daily sulfuric acid was added and uh, to the same volume of c and the mixture turned orange one centimeter cubed of ethanol was added to the orange mixture which was heated gently the mixture turned green they say identify by name or formula the ions responsible for the colors observed now here there is something important remember we have something yellow and of course since we have already established that the cation is copper 2 plus it leaves us with this being the anion remember they said one cation and one anion and we know the only yellow anion is going to be chromate 6 like i've already said so when they add to chromate 6 when they add acid the chromate 6 uh, let me write it again here you react it with acid it's gonna oxidize sorry not oxidation it's gonna convert it to the other one in oxidation state six as well which is uh, dichromate six two minus however how do we finish writing this equation you will balance uh the, the you balance the chromates first by putting a two here and after you balance that this makes the oxygens eight on this side you have to add water the other side to fully balance the oxygens and when you do that put a two here again this is a reversible reaction like that so this is the reaction that occurs so this part here is going to be yellow and that is going to be orange so that is how we see the colors that are going to result here this is the h uh, the sulfuric acid that is going to be added uh, in this reaction so the first question says one centimeter cube of ethanol was added to the orange mixture which was heated gently and the mixture turned green identified by name or formula the ions responsible for the colors so the yellow color of course is going to be chromate 6 the orange color is the chromate 6 and the green color is going to be chromium 3. how do we know about this ethanol is an alcohol ethanol when you combine it with the with the, in this case they say was added to the orange mixture when you add ethanol to dichromate 6 when there was acid present it means the ethanol is going to be oxidized heating gently the gentle heating it means the reaction was not that fervent or it was not that vigorous so in this case when they say uh the color the green color is going to be due to chromium 3 because a redox reaction occurs where the ethanol is going to be oxidized as the dichromate 6 is going to be reduced to chromium 3 then next they say suggest the name or formula of the organic product formed in the green mixture now this green mixture could be an aldehyde which is uh, ethanol or it could be a carboxylic acid which is ethanoic acid however because they say gentle heating i decided to put here the aldehyde but there is no way you can control further oxidation to form a carboxylic acid although uh, and, and, and under certain conditions i think should, to, both answers should be acceptable give the name of formula of compound a compound a contain copper 2 plus and it contain chromate 6 so it's copper 2 chromate next give a possible reason why compound a is green easy because it, it's a mixture of course of copper two which is blue and chromate six which is yellow so observing the two colors gives a green appearance this brings us to the end of question one Let's question two this. this question is about three organic compounds p q and r again remember this is about organic compounds are uh, the compounds these compounds are isomers with a molecular formula that since we have two oxygens watch out could be of course an ester carboxylic acid or anything else 
So compound P is a colorless liquid with a sweet smell. Good. Anything in, uh, in organic chemistry when it's, it has a sweet smell, that is uh, proving that it's an ester. When a sample of P was heated with sodium hydroxide, a volatile product was formed, which had a molecular ion peak in the mass, to char or in the mass spectrum at mass to charge 46. So here they say it volatile, meaning it's easily it easily evaporates. And again, there is something here they, saw, they talked about sodium hydroxide. I don't know if you guys remember from your chemistry, when you get an ester and react it with sodium hydroxide, that is alkaline hydrolysis. This is going to be alkaline hydrolysis. This sodium hydroxide is going to be, of course, a solution. It's aqueous. When you carry out alkaline hydrolysis of an ester, you form a carboxylic salt as well as an alcohol. So it means the volatile substance would have been the alcohol that is generated. Now, if this alcohol had a mass to charge ratio in the mass spectrum of 46, a mass to charge, uh, it's going to be, um, let's see, you put the OH first and then you position the hydrogen. This is 17. So 46 minus 17 leaves us with ethanol CH3, CH2, because this is 29 plus 46. That gives us, a four, uh, sorry, 29 plus 17 gives us a 46. So this tells you that the alcohol or the volatile substance actually produced was ethanol. So we're going to say the mass spectrum of P has a strong peak at 43. If they had a strong peak at 43, that shows you that there is a, the biggest, the bigger fragment was about 43. I don't mean the biggest in size, but the highest amount was about 43. They said it used the structure of P and justify your answer using all this information. So let's go down here. Of course, we know that the part that is going to be the sweet fruity smell suggests an ester that is one mark. And the reaction between an ester and sodium hydroxide results into a carboxylic salt and an alcohol, which is the volatile product. Based on the mass to charge ratio, the alcohol is ethanol. That is when you get your second mark. Now, again, they say the compound P, uh, it forms a strong peak at 43. A strong peak at 43 could be due to this fragment. It means if you had an, uh, an ester that had some ethanol part. Again, remember, if you carry out alkaline hydrolysis of an ester, the part, that came, the part that came from an alcohol in the formation of the ester is the part that goes back to the alcohol. So it means if we have a, um, a higher fragment or more fragments as, as that, it means this is part of the part that came from the carboxylic part during the formation of the ester. So lastly... They say P, uh, lastly, they told us P, uh, they, they wanted to deduce the structure of P. So because P had a very high uh, a, a fragment at 43, which is see that, that. And then we know also it, it had a CH3, CH2, O. This is from the ethanol, which is, this one here should have been from the carboxylic acid. So these two came together and produced the ester we're looking for. So this is one that is 43. And that is uh, the part that can lead to formation of a 46. So the ester should be ethyl, ethanoate, as I have put here. So the next part says, when sodium hydrogen carbonate, sodium hydrogen carbonate is added to separate samples of Q and R, effervescence occurs. Now, if effervescence occurs, then it means Q and R are going to be carboxylic acids. Again, you guys know they can use sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium carbonate to test for presence of a carboxylic acid because when you react a carboxylic acid with sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate, effervescence occurs of a gas that turns lime water milky. This is carbon dioxide gas. It turns lime water milky. So it means both are going to be carboxylic acids. So let's see. So they said it used the two possible structures of the carboxylic acid. If we go back up here, remember they said all of them have the molecular formula carbon 4, hydrogen 8 or 2. So when we come here, let me use a green pen to make it uh, clearer. If we know that the carboxylic acid, its COH group is going to be at the end. And uh, so if it's at the end and we have a carbon 2, hydrogen, I think they saw carbon, uh, carbon 4, hydrogen 8 or 2, we have already taken care of the oxygens and we are looking for, of course, seven carbons, seven hydrogens and three, three carbons that have not been taken care of. So CH3, CH2, CH2, that could be the first carboxylic acid, which is that. 
Another possible carboxylic acid is when there is a branching. Again, remember that the carboxylic part has to be at the end. So if there is a branching, it should be within the other carbons other than the carbon of the carboxylic acid. So this is the other possible carboxylic acid that could be produced. So I say since they react with sodium hydroxide to form effervescence of carbon dioxide gas, they are both carboxylic acids. And these are the two carboxylic acids that can have that specific molecular formula. Let's go to the next part. They say a simplified high resolution proton NMR spectrum of Q is shown. The relative peak areas are given above are each set of peaks. So there is real peak area, peak area is one, here one, and this is gonna be six. Meaning the ratio of the hydrogens in this environment to that environment to that environment are one to one to six. So let us see. They say deduce the structure of Q fully justifying your uh, is fully justifying your answer. Remember we have seen two possible two possible esters. There was a CH3, CH2, CH2, C O O H. And there was a CH3, CH, CH3, and a COOH. If these are the two esters, we can see how many proton environments are there, first of all. We have, for, for the first ester, let me call them A and B. For ester A, we have the first proton environment, the second proton environment, the third, and the fourth. So here we have four proton environments. It doesn't make sense with the mass spectrum we've been given. But for this one here, we have environment one, environment two, and environment three. So this is okay. Those are three proton environments. And in this environment, we have six hydrogens. Here we have, uh, of course, uh, here we have one hydrogen, and there we have one hydrogen, making it sensible. So that is why you see that is the possible structure of Q. The next they say, uh, of course, the just the structure of Q. This is what I went to. I said presence of three peaks indicates three proton environment. If you compare with what I've done here, here we have three proton environments. Environments with a second ester, with a second carboxylic acid. But here we had four proton environments with the first carbon, carboxylic acid. Okay, proton environments. There is environment one, environment two, environment three, and environment four. Here we have this environment that's the same, the second, the third. So this is the first mark. We have three proton environments, and the peak area ratio is basically one to six to one to one to six, meaning the two environments, of course, two environments are one proton each, and the third environment has six protons. Let us go to the splitting pattern and see if it makes sense. Guys, I'm gonna erase this to create some space. Remember, we have already established our ester, so let me cut this out so that we can see the splitting pattern. This one is split into a singlet, and this is split into, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Accept it. And this one here is split into a doublet. That means if this is split into a doublet, it means it's near a proton. Using the n plus one rule, it's near an environment with one proton next to one proton. This one here is next to six protons. That is why it's a septet. And this one here is next to no proton, next to zero protons. Let us see from our structure, look at our structure and see if this makes sense. This one here is next to one proton. Okay, which is gonna be that environment, the doublet. And this one here, is next to six protons, so it's going to be that environment. Well, so this one is that, while the last one is next to no proton, and that is going to be this environment. So that peak is responsible to that environment, as you can see. So that is talking about the splitting pattern. You can say septet or you can say have tuplet, meaning there are seven. Uh, N plus one rule, we say six plus one, so that would be seven. Now you can go on to the next part. Allow me to cut out this. And then we go to the next property, which is going to be the next property, which is going to be, of course, the chemical shifts. Here you have to use your data booklet, the chemical shift at 1.2 ppm. And uh, that is going to be a doublet. And then this is doublet. And then that uh, protons are adjacent a proton environment with six protons. And there is this one here, 
which shows that the environment nearby, in, in, the, in the showing the protons whose environment is closer to the six protons. So this brings us to the end of question, question two. Three. A group of students carried out an experiment to determine the right equation for the reaction between bromide and bromate 5 ions in acid conditions. The equation for this reaction is as below. So here we're given bromate 5 reacting with bromide uh, in the presence of acid to produce two products. So the procedure for this experiment is to determine the order of reaction with respect to bromate 5. If you want to determine the order of reaction with respect to a specific reactant, you will vary that reactant and keep everything else constant. So we're going to vary the concentration of this and keep this constant and keep this constant as well. So let's see the first step. They say measure 10 centimeters cubed of aqueous phenol solution into a boiling tube and add five drops of methyl red indicator. So step one, we're going to add to here phenol, methyl red indicator, so, you know, phenol is not mentioned in the question, so it's not part of the whole reaction. Its purpose, we do not yet know. So they say, add 5 centimeters cubed of potassium bromide. So we will add again, potassium bromide, potassium bromide. Let me just say bromide ions. Uh, so this is going to be 5 centimeters cubed. The phenol was 10 centimeters cubed, uh, phenol solution. So that was 10 centimeters cubed. And then they're going to say, uh, Mix the contents of the two boiling tubes and start the timer. So actually, there is a step I missed. Step three says measure 15 centimeters cube of a potassium bromate 5 into a second boiling tube and then mix the contents of the two boiling tubes and start a timer. So immediately when we add bromate 5, that is when the timer is started because it's the bromate that is going to react with the other two, uh, with uh, bromide basically. So uh, recall the time, T, when the color of the methyl red is bleached from red to colorless by excess bromine. Then they go on to, do, to say, repeat the experiment using different volumes of potassium bromide. This is what we are varying. But here they have said volume, not concentration. So if you're using volume as a way of varying concentration, it means the total volume of the whole solution has to be kept constant. So here they say adding distilled water so that the total volume is always 40 centimeters cube. This is what we are working for, having a total volume of 40 centimeters cube. So question A says two of the hazards warning signs for phenol are the first one is corrosive of course and the other is toxic. Then they say state the most important hazard associated with phenol in this experiment. Phenol has an OH group so between phenol molecules there can be intermolecular hydrogen bonds. There is that possibility. It means it's going to have a little bit higher uh, boiling temperature, so it's, well, it will not be that volatile in comparison to it being corrosive. So the most dangerous thing right now is, uh, of course, wearing safety goggles because it's toxic and it's going to be basically corrosive. So here, either apart from wearing safety goggles and a lab coat, somebody has to wear gloves to protect their fingers or for protect themselves from being uh, from the reactants, basically, which is phenol. The next part says, explain the purpose of phenol in this experiment. Phenol is going to react with the bromine. If you remember here, they said, uh, well, I will go back when they say excess. Aha, uh -huh, here. Recall the time when the color of methyl red is bleached from red to colorless by excess bromine. It means this bromine is going to be produced, but however, there will be some bromine that is going to be excess, meaning left left around so bromine is produced but it reacts with something and then the excess bromine is the one that is going to react with the indicator so phenol will be the one to use up the bromine and then the remaining bromine after all the phenol is completed is going to be able to bleach the indicator so i said phenol rapidly reacts with bromine that has been formed uh, in this reaction and when all the phenol is used up the excess bromine bleaches the indicator this enables the process of the the progress of the reaction to be monitored from a fixed point. So basically, they will monitor the reaction after all the 10 centimeters cubed of the phenol solution have been reacted with, meaning we can have time to monitor the reaction from the same starting point. So suggest a way of making the disappearance of methyl red color easier to see. You will place a white tile at the bottom of the tube you are using to carry out this experiment so that you can see the transition in the color clearly. Next part says, a student's results are shown. 
Here we see the results of this experiment from run one to run six. Here we see they vary the volume of, brom of bromate phi by decreasing it gradually as they kept the, the bro uh, volume of bromide, bromide, sorry, uh, bromide and uh, the volume of the acid constant. So here we can see the volume of water is decreasing as the vo increasing as the volume of bromate 5 is decreasing. So they're asking, state why the total volume of the mixture is kept constant. The total volume of the mixture has to be kept constant. Since water is not reacting with anything, increasing the volume, or volume of water as the concentration of bromate is being decreased, it ensures that we are only varying the number of moles, or actually, in real, is the concentration that is being varied. So the number of moles are going to be become smaller, smaller, smaller. It means the concentration is going to be decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. So we are trying to decrease the volume of bromate, 5, as we keep everything else constant. The volume of the total reactant solution has to be kept constant as well. The key thing here is to v decrease the volume of bromate, 5, uh, so that the concentration is actually the one that is decreasing since volume, volume of bromate 5 is going to be proportional to the concentration of bromate 5. So this part here says plot a graph of reciprocal of 1 over T against the volume of bromate 5 solution. So you will go to your data. Let me minimize this. You will plot vertically 1 over T, the units are per second, and then horizontally the volume of bromate 5 in centimeters cubed. This is times 10 power negative 3 to make it easier to plot on the same scale. So you will join a line of best fit through the point, uh, but it has to go through the origin. And since this is a straight line through the origin, it tells us that the order of reaction with respect to bromate 5 is first order, a straight line through the origin. Let's go on. Take the order of reaction with respect to bromate 5 ions and justify your answer. From previously, we have seen that the, curve we, the graph we have drawn is going to be was red against concentration or red against volume, and it was a straight line through the origin, so it's going to be first order with respect to bromide, uh, bromate 5, sorry, because the graph e of red against time, or this should be concentration, let me clean up that, red against concentration is a uh, a straight line through the origin so that is it and then uh, next part says the reciprocal which is one over t is used as a measure of the rate in this experiment suggest the assumption on which this depends why do we use this uh, one over t to be equal to rate or to be proportional to rate so suggest the assumption on which this depends uh, this depends or refer in your answer in the shape uh, of a typical graph of a reactant concentration against time. So we know this is the typical curve of a reactant concentration against time. We assume that since we're going to have so many reactants or that reactant concentration is going to be higher at the beginning, as time progresses, the rate is going to be rapid at the beginning and it's going to slow down as time goes on. So usually the initial part is going to be a straight line which is, whose gradient is proportional to the rate of reaction. And since when we draw a graph of rate against concentration, we usually use the initial rate at a specific concentration. So the initial rate is going to be that. Maybe when you're drawing a, gra um, a curve or something, let me take it to be like this. We usually measure using the initial rate. So because we use the initial rate, whether we use 1 over t, it's going to be kind of similar or proportional to uh, the rate. So I said it's assumed that the methyl rate is decolorized earlier in the reaction as the graph is almost linear. You can see that it's almost linear. So the gradient of the tangent at this point is similar to the change in the concentration against change uh, in concentration against time, which is basically the rate. Initially, this part here is going to be similar to the rate of reaction. The next part says another student accidentally measured 8.5 centimeters uh, cubed of bromate. Uh, bromate 5 rather than 8.0 in run 4 they say explain whether or not this portion of potassium bromate should be discarded this portion should not be discarded all the student needs to do is uh, they should adjust the water volume so that the total solution is going to be 40 centimeters cubed including the final solution if you exclude the final solution so it's going to be 30 but including everything it should be 40 centimeters cubed this is excluding Phenol, but including phenol, everything should be 40 centimeters cubed. So here 
in this case, uh, I say this portion does not need to be discarded. They can plot the data, but use the volume of water at 6.5 instead of 7.0. 7.0 would be added if it was 8.0, but if you use this, it's going to be basically uh, 8.5. You're going to use 6.5 centimeters cubed, provided the total volume is the same, uh, whatever does what not do matter. Say? All the volume measurements in this experiment were measured using a 50 centimeter cube, you're right? Give a reason why potassium bromate 5 solution is first measured into a separate boiling tube rather than directly into the reaction mixture. So uh, we can think about a situation like this. We will first, because these two are going to react together, the bromate as well as the bromide, and of course in the acid conditions, we want to have the volume required for each experiment measured out before we mix them. Because if we use a 50 centimeter cube burette to release the bromide, the bromate into the, the other reactants, it is, the, the burette is going to release a little by little, which is not going to enable us to have all the volume or the total volume in one reaction mixture before the reaction begins. So here we need all reactants to be together as the reaction begins. And if, if all reactants are together before the reaction begins, then we can be able to start or to monitor the reaction from one single starting point. Therefore, our results will be accurate from this experiment. So the next part says, give two reasons why RUN1 has the lowest uncertainty in volume measurements. Volume measurements, are, to determine the uncertainty in volume measurements, we have to measure bigger volumes. You measure bigger volumes. And then number two, we need to minimize the number of measurements we carry out. Minimize the number of measurements you carry out. Now in one one you realize we had the highest volume of bromate, 15 centimeters cubed, and actually we had no water measure. So elimination of water as well as having the largest volume of bromate 5 allowed us to have the minimum uh, error or minimum uncertainty in the volume measurement. So I say the volume of bromate 5 in run one is 15 centimeters. This has the largest uh, of course, the largest volume of bromate 5 and will therefore have the lowest measurement uncertainty using no water, eliminate, at all eliminates the measurement uncertainty from measuring water. So this is a good idea or an advantage uh, in minimizing the error. The next part, which is part F says, state the changes that you would make to the procedure to obtain the data needed to determine the overall rate equation for the reaction between bromi bromide and bromate ions in acid. The key thing we need to know here is we are reacting bromate 5 with bromide in presence of the acid. And if we had a right equation, it's going to be right is equal to K, concentration of bromate 5, concentration of bromide, and concentration of the acid. Now we know this is going to be order with respect A. We have the order B and order C. So let me put this on the side about here. And now, to determine the value of A, we already know A is order 1, based from the experiment. However, we do not know B and we do not know C. So from the first experiment we did, we varied this, keeping that and that constant, and we realized that A is equal to first order. So what we will do for the next, we'll keep this constant, vary that, and keep that constant, and draw a graph, look at the shape of the graph to predict the order with respect to bromide. And then the next part will keep this constant, keep that constant and vary that. Look at the shape of the graph and determine the order with respect to the acid. And then we fill out the value of A, B, and C. And that will give us the right equation. Let's continue on to question four. four. A group of students prepared aspirin from 2-hydroxybenzoic acid using ethan ethanoic and hydride. So it means we have the 2-hydroxybenzoic acid, ethanoic and hydride. And this is the product we're interested in. We're going to use the data in the table. Here we have the molar mass, which is important, the density, as well as the melting points, which we will use in later on. Uh, so the procedure says, step one, weigh two grams of 2-hydroxybenzoic acid and put them in a pure shaped flask. Clamp the, two fla the flask and suspend it in a water bath containing cold water. Step two, add 5 centimeters cubed of ethanoic and hydride to 2-hydroxybenzoic acid and add five drops of concentrated sulfuric acid to the mixture of the flask. In the flask, add anti-bumping granules and fix a reflux condenser onto the flask. Next, step three says warm the mixture by heating in a water bath using a Bunsen burner and then gently swirl the mixture until the solid has dissolved. Step four, continue warming the mixture for another 10 minutes. Step five, remove the flask from the hot water 
that and add 10 centimeters cubed of crushed ice and some distilled water. So this part of adding crushed ice and distilled water will be important. Step six says, turn the flask in a beaker of ice water until normal aspirin crystals form. Step seven, filter off the aspirin crystals using a button funnel and suction apparatus. Step eight, wash the aspirin crystals with minimum volume of uh, ice, ice, of course, iced water. And then step nine, recrystallize the aspirin crystals using a mixture of ethanol and water. So ethanol and water, this is going to be the solvent for the recrystallization. So let's begin with the questions here. They say, give a reason for placing a flask in cold water in step one. Usually, if you place a flask where the reactants are in cold water, it's because that reaction is exothermic. So we are trying to cool down the reaction in order to avoid overheating or to avoid excessive release of heat. Part B says, suggest the reason of the concentrated sulfuric acid. This is going to be a catalyst for this reaction. Uh, it's a catalyst, basically. Then part C say show by calculation that the ethanoic anhydride is in excess in this preparation all we need to do here is to get the data from the table we were given the density and we know the volume so i'm going to use this to determine the mass of ethanoic anhydride so it will be density times volume to give us that which is 5.41 grams you have to make sure that the units of density and mass and uh, the volume make sense in order to give you the mass you're looking for so after finding the mass we already know the molar mass of ethanoic anhydride so since we know the mass we use the molar mass to find the number of moles after finding the number of moles we keep them remember from the reaction equation ethanoic anhydride and two hydroxybenzoic acid react in a ratio of one to one so back we go and use the two grams given and the molar mass we know from the table and then we find the number of moles of 2-hydroxybenzoic acid. Then we look at the ratio. If you look at 1.449 times 10 power negative 2 and 5.304 times 10 power negative 2, you realize this is a bigger value. Therefore, ethanoic anhydride was in excess. The student drew the diagram of the apparatus used for the reflux in step 4. So here we can see the apparatus the student drew. And then they say identify the three errors in the student's diagram. Assume that the apparatus is clamped correctly so remember they say this is a reflux condenser that is inserted a reflux condenser should not be closed above here the water should be coming in here and going out at the top and this is not a boiling tube or it's not a, a pure shaft flask so it should be uh, this is not a pure shaft flask so those are the three mistakes we can see so i said the refluxing condenser is sealed at the top. It shouldn't be sealed. The direction of the water flow is wrong. Water should be flowing in down here to go in so that it can cool in order for the volatile substances to be cooled immediately and return to the reacting flask and then get out here. And then this should be a boiling flask or a pH of flask. So the boiling flask could be example a round bottom flask or should not be should be used instead of a conical flask. Next says, suggest the purpose of adding crushed ice and distilled water in step five. Remember we had excess ethanoic anhydride and we had to find a way of removing it. To do this, we react it, we, we add water, crushed ice, and then distilled water in order to ensure that they, they remove the excess ethanoic anhydride. The last page here says, the filtration in step seven is carried out under reduced pressure. State two advantages of this method compared with ordinary gravity filtration. This filtration under reduced pressure is going to be faster and it removes almost all the water. So the aspirin is going to come out as if it's almost dry and the filtration is going to be faster, making sure that the time for the whole experiment is going to be reduced. If you use normal gravity filtration, it's going to take longer because the water is dripping out without any assistance. But G says, describe how the purity of the recrystallized aspirin could be tested experimental details are not required carry out melting point determination because these are crystals and if there is a sharp melting point observed then we can know that the sample is actually pure now you remember they gave us information from the table that uh, the, the melting point is about 136 or you could look at the data booklet value the melting point for the sample should be about here in order for us to know that the sample has been pure so there should be a sharp melting point which is approximately close to the data booklet value, leading us to uh, to, pray, to know that the sample is actually pure. This brings us to the Thank end of this Thank you for watching video. this video. Again, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you again in the next video.
Bye-bye.